Je m'appelle Kevin McMillan. Je suis euh, co-coordinateur avec euh, Sir John Vucetic du réseau en, réseau en théorie internationale, le RT, The International Theory Network, euh, qui euh, fonctionne à, à l'échelle de, de, de la ville d'Ottawa euh, et de la région. Euh, C'est la première dans notre série de conférences euh, cette année. Euh, et on commence avec... Euh, euh, un livre, la présentation d'un livre, euh, un, un ouvrage euh, collectif euh, qui, qui s'intitule « The Return of the Public in Global Governance ». Um, it's edited by um, Alexandra Gaichu and Jacqueline Best, who will be with us in a moment. She just went upstairs to grab her notes. Um, and uh, we are also fortunate enough to have a couple of the uh, other participants, contributors to the book uh, with us today. That's Michael Williams and Matt Patterson from uh, the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs and the School of Political Studies, respectively. Um, so today, we're, the basic format that we're going to use, we're going to have a surgeon moderating. Uh, we're going to have discussions of about our presentations of about 10 minutes each from each of the participants. And then after that, we hope to have a vibrant Q&A session. Um, so without further ado, I think I'll hand over the mic to surgeon. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, very much. And thanks to all of my colleagues. Uh, the way I see it, it's only a small exaggeration. This is La Creme de la Creme of the Faculty of Social Science, so we're all very lucky to have you here. Alexandra, why don't you take five to ten minutes to present the frame of the book, and then, uh, and then we'll give ten minutes to each of you to talk about the theoretical and empirical co contributions of your uh, individual chapters. Okay, well, thank you so much, and uh, thank you, Kevin, thank you, Serge, and many thanks to all of you for making time to join us today as we launch a book that grew out of a set of conversations that Jackie and I started a few years ago about changes in practices of governance in our respective fields of study, and that is international political economy, in Jackie's case, and international security, in my case. As we were discussing about recent events, as well as current scholarship, we were struck by a set of similarities in these seemingly different areas of global life. In both IP and international security, public concerns and public actors seem to be on the rise. And yet, the form of these new public dynamics seem to be very different from what we had witnessed in the past. So it was time for us to investigate this a bit further. And in order to do so, uh, we brought together a group of international scholars in the spring of 2009 in a workshop that examined the rearticulation of the relationship between public and private in different issue areas, including international finance, development, environmental governance, IP, and um, international security. And, well, many more conversations later. The book you see today is the final product of those initial discussions. At the very heart of our project lies what we think is a really interesting puzzle. After a couple of decades of neoliberal governance that extols the virtues of the market, things seem to be shifting. And yet shifting in ways that had not been anticipated by policymakers or analysts. Increasingly, we see examples of public intervention in many areas of life. Think, for instance, about recent examples of state intervention to address a financial crisis that was caused, or seen to be caused, by the reckless behavior of private actors. Think also about the ways in which transnational flows of people, goods, and services are increasingly subjected to monitoring by public authorities. And let's not forget the ways in which private companies are increasingly required to collaborate with public authorities, including by uh, disclosing confidential information about their clients. So what's going on? Well, based on all these examples, we could be tempted to conclude that the public is back with a vengeance. But is it? And that's really the question that's at the heart of our volume. And our answer is yes and no. The public is indeed back, but not as we knew it. 
And we argue, unless we transcend conventional wisdom about what and where the public is, we are not going to be able to understand the dynamics and implications of its apparent return. Jackie will say more about this in a moment, but for now, let me just say that we are very grateful to ITN for organizing this book launch uh, for many reasons, but above all, because it gives us a chance to thank publicly to some of the individuals and institutions that made this uh, book possible. And above all, we would like to thank our contributors, uh, Matt and Mike and all the others, for their superb scholarship and for not losing faith in this project during its long gestation period. Equally, we are very grateful to several grad students for their invaluable research and editorial assistance. And I see Chris Light here, so a huge thank you uh, for a wonderful job, Chris. And also our thanks to Natalie Britton and Rob McNeil and Philippe Roseberry. And institutionally, we are very grateful to the Faculty of Social Sciences and the Office of Vice President Research for financial support. And last but not least, uh, we are grateful to Roland Paris and the entire SIPS team past and present for their great financial and logistical support and above all for support for that initial workshop without which this volume would not have been possible. Uh, I apologize for my voice, I just have a bad cold, but let me just invite Jackie to say a few words and once again many thanks to all of you for coming. Thank you. Well I'm just going to say a few introductory <coughs> remarks and then pass it on to our contributors to talk a little bit more substantively about the material in the, in the book. Um, so as Alexander has suggested, recent events make it clear, we argue, that the public is back, but in a different form than in the past. So what does that mean? What has changed? Um, I'm going to radically oversimplify it in the interest of time, but to put it sim you know, very simply, you know, we traditionally in the past have tended to think of public and private as separate spheres. That's one of the very common metaphors that we use. And you think about the, 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 the metaphor of sphere, we have this notion that the private is the space of the market or of the personal, the public that of the state, and then also often of a more sort of civil society or a, a conception of, of the general public. But again, there's a, there's a thinking here of two distinct areas located in different places with their own logics. Okay, what we're suggesting here and what the cases in this book I think suggest is that this is no longer always the case. Um, and I want to just to give you a bit of sense of, of what we're talking about. I'm just going to talk very briefly about a chapter from the book um, by Eric Kleiner on international finance because that's one of the subjects that, that this book treats and that other members today are not going to be talking about. It's also a very current issue and one of course that's dear to my heart. Um, so after the financial crisis, Eric Kleiner suggests, we saw a shift to uh, re-regulating derivatives, to seeing derivative products, options, swaps, all the world of shadow banking, um, an area that had been unregulated and deregulated for a considerable length of time, as suddenly there was a shift to seeing it as a matter of public concern. You know, obviously because it was a matter in that sense, okay, that these private actions had had profound impacts across societies on a global level. So after decades of deregulation, there was an effort to begin thinking about how to regulate this space, these, these, these products and so on. So we did see a shift to re-regulation, but we certainly didn't see, it wasn't a return to Bretton Woods or to the activist state of the 60s and the 70s. Instead, what we saw emerging over time was an effort to meet various kinds of pu these public goals um, through what we would traditionally understand as private actors um, and, and processes, so the, the creation of clearing houses of trading platforms, of a range of different mechanisms that allowed greater oversight, but that largely left it to the markets to run the show themselves. So what kind of a public is this if we're seeing the return of the public? Well, we do see public concerns and the framing, the narrating suddenly of derivatives that had been really off out of people's vision suddenly claims that this is suddenly that this was an important issue of matter of public concern. Um, we arguably have the creation of, of these public goods that are forms of, of regulation and so on. Um, and we have the reliance on what we might think of as public processes or processes that look a lot like the kinds of processes or concerns that we associate with the liberal public sphere. So and a lot of emphasis on transparency, on openness, on publicity, of making these shadowy things suddenly visible. Um, so in some senses, this resonates. What seems to be going on looks a, you know, looks a bit like what we've described as the public in the past. But at the same time, we can't clearly define the actors involved as public in a traditional sense. They're not part of the state they're, or civil society. They're 
or again, depending on your definition of civil society, but they are, they are uh, firms or market actors. These are the main players in this context who are involved in and who are engaged in these public practices. So what we're suggesting is in cases like this, what we're seeing, we need to think of the public less about who you are or where you are and more about what you're actually doing. That the public needs to be thought of a set of practices, practices that involve perhaps making claims about something as public, practices involve doing it in a particular way that is also, again, claimed as being public. Um, and what we see in the, in the various chapters is similar kinds of patterns where we see a much more complex and fluid conception of the public as practice emerging in environmental governance, which Matt Patterson is going to talk about, international development, which I'm going to talk about briefly in my chapter, international security, which, and international security that Alexander is going to talk about. So to conclude this little intro, why does this matter, which I think is a question that I no doubt Mike will also come back to in, in his conclusion to this. Um, and I think well, just about all the chapters in this volume suggest that this, the, the return of the public and the particular form that the public is taking has some very significant political consequences. The kind of public that we're seeing returning is a lot thinner and less democratic than what we saw in the past. And I think we can think of this in two ways. On one hand, who counts as the public? Who are these voices, people whose voices need to be heard, who deserve to be considered as, as part of the public? That question of who counts as the public, that group has got a lot smaller. And we think about that, the case of, of, of finance that Eric Kleiner looks at. Early on, there were all sorts of discussions about the impacts of the financial deregulation on inequality and poverty and so on. And, and, and the, sort of the scope of who counted as the public and whose concerns needed to matter was actually quite broad. But by the time we got back to re-regulating, the public whose concerns were being concerned was far, far more limited. And all of those kinds of concerns and issues were largely off the table. And we were just talking about you know, ensuring stability and avoiding another meltdown. And we weren't talking about creating a more just economic order. So who counts as the public is a lot smaller, and what counts as a legitimate public process, I would argue, is a lot less robust than the kind of genuine deliberation debate that we've tended to associate with the public sphere in the past. And I think Matt might speak to that a bit. I certainly will um, when I talk about the case of international development. So I'll leave things there and turn it over to Matt Patterson to, to talk about the case of environmental governance. Okay, thank you. I thought I, I thought I would take the opportunity to start with a cheap joke because you know why not? Um, which is, uh, but it is demonstration that in many contexts, uh, public and private are increasingly difficult to just separate from each other. I'm not going to throw these at you. Don't worry, you don't have to get scared. Um, but I am going to sell them to Jackie and you owe me four bucks. And um, so, in lots of contexts, including da from daily life up to global governance, the point there is that is that. You know, this is an ostensibly we would call this a public space where there is, you know, engagement. So even if it's not a space of public governance necessarily, depending on how you define governance, it's a public space, and yet commercial activity just went on. <laughs> um, and private activity in the sense that Jackie can now deprive you of access to those fantastic eggs, which unless you've had them or you grow, <laughs> or you have your own chickens, you will never taste as good eggs. And there's several other people in the room I hope would attest to that. Um, what I'm actually going to talk about is climate change, because that's the subject of my chapter in the book, and as, as well as my research in general. Um, and I start in that chapter with, at one level, a banal ob observation that it is routine to talk about climate change as a public issue, or and in the way that they uh, that Jackie and Alexandra define Jack uh, climate um, publicness in the introduction to the book as a, of a, you know those things that have are an issue of common concern as one one sort of definition it's sort of quintessentially that so and it's also often framed in global governance debates as the quintessential collective action problem or the quintessential public goods problem, um, especially by economists who dominate those debates. I mean, the, the framing of public goods is ubiquitous in those um, uh, statements, and if you look at the sort of authoritative statement of the state of the art, like by the IPCC and so on, that's exactly the principal framing of the nature of climate change as a governance problem. Um, but what I, was, what I try and do in the chapter is then to come back about, is to approach climate change from another sort of framing, um, which is popular amongst uh, engineers, so those interested in social ecological systems, um, and increasingly by a bunch of people, uh, notably Matthew Hoffman, um, 
uh, in in uh, global governance studies of international politics, um, which think which starts with thinking of climate change as a problem of complexity. It's not unique to climate change, but it is perhaps the the, the again uh, a sort of paradigmatic example. Um, and so, if we think about climate change as a problem of complexity, then immediate then then what that invokes is a uh, first and foremost in this in in this sort of context of what, what we might mean by the word public and its return is first and foremost there is no single site where any decisions are being made so that one can no longer talk about the public sphere as a singular thing. Um, complexity implies that you've got a, uh, a complex interacting system with multiple sites of decisions, uh, unintended consequences in the interactions between those sites of decisions, them operating at multiple scales from the, from the daily uh, production of eggs up to the actions of the United Nations and global corporations um, uh, uh, with myriad different types of actors. Um, the sources of greenhouse gas emissions are in everyday actions from organising academic events to producing eggs to uh, you know, how we move about, etc., etc. Um, and there is no single site where any, any plausible central decision making could actually exist that affects all of those things in an authoritative way. Um, the second the second observation, which is expressly in the case of Matt Hoffman's work, is that the other consequence of that is that actors, any individual actor within that complex interacting system doesn't really have the faintest clue how to act in the world uh, in, in a way that will actually have the effects they intend. Right? So there's a sort of radical um, uncertainty and a radical, if you like, modesty of ambition that any one person, let's say a city, trying to think about how the city of Ottawa manages its greenhouse gas emissions, which it is currently trying to do, for example, um, along with many other cities, um, it doesn't really have a serious knowledge about what will be the effects of light rail on greenhouse gas emissions, or changing the planning system, or um, working with the province to up the building code or working with the uh, Ottawa Renewable Energy Coalition to a uh, cooperative to build lots and lots of solar roofs on school roofs in the city, all of which are real world examples of things that it's doing as part of that um, effort. And so what you see as a mode of governing is not so much authoritative rulemaking, collective decision making in the classic political sense, but collective mutual learning. Um, experimentation is Mal Hoffman's um, uh, conceptualization of that. People don't know really what they're doing. They try stuff, they see if they think it works, they see how it interacts with other stuff going on. Other people are doing some things at the same, same sort of time and, you know, and, and the system moves forward or doesn't, um, depending. So those two qualities of climate change is a problem where there are no single sites of decision making and governance is oriented towards learning and experimentation rather than authoritative collective decision making seem to me uh, are, are the way in the chapter that I tried to sort of think through what does the, what does the word public and maybe private mean in that sort of context. Um, and the way I do that in, in the chapter is, is, is two sorts of e examples drawn from a much broader set of research, and I'm also going to do a plug for a, a book that's come out more recently, which I was involved, which is a ten-author monograph written by social scientists, if anybody wants to imagine the uh, collective action problem involved in that, um, called Transnational Climate Change Governance, where we look at 60 transnational climate governance initiatives of the, some of the examples that I talked about, city networks, corporate uh, investment networks, car markets, all sorts of things. Um, and so, so these two that I do in the chapter are in the chapter for Jackie and Alex's book, uh, Alexandra's book, sorry, is uh, are drawn from some of that broader study um, in a way. And the first one is, is that there is a body of climate change governance which is routinely identified as privatized governance or private governance. So you've got large networks of institutional investors trying to get other companies to disclose their emissions. You've got um, carbon markets having emerged, carbon offsets, and et cetera, et cetera. And you've got NGOs and business groups trying to regulate those markets transnationally. Is this the return of the public? Um, Obviously, there's greater awareness of and concern about the role of the state and public institutions, um, but it's not the same public we saw before. And certainly those who are advocating this are very careful to differentiate themselves from the past and say, you know, we're not like the deregulationist uh, 1980s, but we're also not like what happened, the sort of state-led development of the 60s and 70s. So if it's not a return of the old public, 
what kind of public is this? I want to suggest very briefly here um, that it's a kind of public that is really seen through the, that sees public actors, public practices through the lens of the market. So how did the World Bank hope to create this demand for good governance? Okay, well, by encouraging participation, um, more consultation with affected groups, by getting groups to put pressure on the government to publish information, and scorecards, and so on. Um, so greater publicity and transparency. So again, as I talked about in the introduction, these are often you know, the kinds of processes that we associate with a liberal public sphere, kinds of processes that we would see of debate and, and so on that about holding a government accountable. But at the same time, I think if we look, dig more deeply, we see that the particular conceptions of the public, of politics, of accountability that are, are here are in fact very thin and very much linked and quite explicitly linked to market framing. And this is made, and this we can see this probably most clearly in the 2004 World Development Report on making, serv was it making services work for poor people. Um, now, World Development Reports are not always that representative of the real thinking at the bank. But when I talk to people consistently <coughs> at the bank, they kept coming back to the concept of accountability that we find in this report. Or you think the title of it is about making services work better for poor people. So it's about increasing accountability is about giving poor people the, the capacity to demand better services from service providers, which is obviously important and very important in, you know, when you're very poor. But it's also a very limited conception of accountability or political accountability. I mean, it's about demanding better products, better. Um, and it, in the report, we see this very clearly where they talk about both slow and fast routes to accountability. The slow route to accountability is a citizen demanding their government change things, maybe voting them out of office, the government then changing services. That takes a while. The fast route to accountability is a consumer changing service providers and saying, you know, it's a classic Hirschman exit voice and loyalty. Um, voice is about demanding it. Exit is simply you exit the market, you say, okay, I don't like the toothbrushes you're making, I'm going to change brands, okay? But this is a very, very thin, impoverished conception of, of accountability as a political you know, concept, obviously. It's, it's about accountability as market accountability. And what's really interesting talking to people at the bank and looking at at the documents is the goal is really to not to replace political accountability with a kind of market accountability, but to create a hybrid, to bring the two together. Um, and so the sort of framing of the citizen as a citizen consumer um, and the framing of, of you know, expressing your views and so on becomes the expressing of preferences um, through surveys, market consultations, and so on. And so you get this kind of telescoping of real political deliberation into this much thinner kind of uh, market. Uh, consultation. So I think this particular case um, makes, just to finish off, makes quite clear that the political stakes of these changes in the public can be very real, um, in, in cer certainly in, cer in this kind of case. And it, I think this case poses a really interesting question or dilemma. I mean, it certainly poses a dilemma for me as a scholar, kind of trying to think not only as a, you know, in a sort of empirical sense of what's going on, but also trying to think normatively about it. That is, should we be glad that these institutions are recognizing the complexity of their job, the importance of public institutions and processes for economic development? This is, I think, a very important step. Or should we just be very worried um, that what we're seeing is the colonization of the public by a kind of market-based logic and a narrowing of public of politics that excludes certain kinds of more meaningful deliberation and contestation? So are we seeing a return of the public but an impoverishment of politics. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, and like Jackie and Matt, my contribution to this volume is actually a slice of a larger project on the changing logic of security provision in post-communist Europe. And this project includes countries that emerged out of the collapse of the former Yugoslavia, like Bosnia and Serbia, countries that are still deeply affected by the conflicts that took place in the 1990s. But it also includes countries that had peaceful, albeit sometimes very difficult, processes of transition, and that are now included in this Euro-Atlantic security community via membership in the EU and NATO. And this would include countries like Bulgaria and Romania. 
So what's interesting, if we look at all these countries, is a sharp contrast between the communist era, when of course the state exercised overwhelming control in the field of security, or perhaps we should say insecurity, and the contemporary situation, where we see a much more diverse and fragmented field of security, and in which that most fundamental public goods security is provided by networks of actors that transcend all kinds of conventional boundaries. They are global, but they're also national. They are state, but they're also non-state. And they certainly transcend the boundary between security and economics. They can be seen as new types of communities of practice that have been profoundly affected by and have also contributed to a broader redefinition of what and where the public is. Now, to understand all these changes, we have to take into account a set of broader regional and global dynamics. And in particular, we have to look at the rise to prominence of neoliberal policies and practices. So we're very lucky to have here Michael Williams, who together with Rita Abrahamson, wrote a wonderful book on security beyond the state, where they look at the impact of those neoliberal policies and practices in the field of security, and they look at particular ways in which those play out in, in Africa. And similar global dynamics have also also affected uh, former communist societies. But to understand the specific ways in which ideas like security privatization, which is legitimized by neoliberal policies, takes place in former communist countries, we also have to take into account those very peculiar communist legacies, as well as the politics of early years post-communist transition. This is what happens right after 1989. And to make a very long story short, uh, we can make sense of that by drawing on Max Weber's concept of political capitalism. We are all, of course, familiar with the concept of the iron cage, uh, Max Weber's fears of bureaucracy. But we are less concerned, perhaps we've paid less attention to his fear of a different political scenario, which involves a de-bureaucratization of the state and the corruption of the civil service. This is the kind of situation where you see politically connected entrepreneurs gaining control over key state assets, which means that core institutions of the state are emasculated and fragmented uh, administrative apparatuses become too weak to perform core functions. And this is what happens by and large in many countries in, uh, in Eastern Europe. What you see is a debureaucratization of the state, which is linked to massive and often deeply flawed privatization processes. And there's an interesting link between the security field and the field of economics, because this type of privatization um, affects the reconstitution of the field of security. Essentially, what you see is a privatization of core assets that had been controlled by security related ministries, like ministries of interior. So these are coercive capabilities, information gathering capabilities, that are now transferred into the hands of strategic networks of political and economic entrepreneurs. And many of them essentially redefine themselves as good liberal actors that participate in the liberalization of their societies by establishing, for instance, private security companies. And what you see is this very peculiar nexus between key individuals within the state, the market, and in many cases, particularly if you look at Bosnia, Serbia, but also countries like Bulgaria, organized crime. And I should say transnationally connected organized criminal groups. Uh, it is a field in which private these strategic private security companies acquire a position of dominance. And they do so by mobilizing different types of material and non-material resources. It, they have access to specialized technology, such as surveillance technology. But they also have access to particular skills, um, for instance, you know, surveillance skills, coercive techniques that they had acquired through their connection to the state. And more broadly, they have a certain, it's almost like a negative prestige, a certain reputation for violence, which is valued in that context because it's a very fluid uh, security environment. There's lots of insecurity. And these actors are seen by their clients as efficient security providers precisely because of their access to those specialized skills and specialized capabilities. So it is, broadly speaking, a type of jungle uh, capitalism that emerges. Now, that situation starts to change in the mid and particularly late 1990s. And it starts to change both because of changes in the domestic political environment and growing pressures for reform 
and I should say that there's a growing concern that some of these private security companies are essentially getting out of control, exercising unlimited, uh, ex unlimited power. But there's also a lot of pressure coming from international actors, and particularly the EU, that becomes heavily involved in pressurizing these countries to address problems of corruption and organized crime. And what you see, therefore, in the late 1990s and early 2000s is once again a reconstitution of the field of security. But what's interesting is that in spite of concerns that these private actors were becoming too powerful and a danger to the state, there is no effort to reject the idea of security commodification. The idea that private actors need to become involved in the provision of public security had become part of, if you will, the normal repertoire of action. So the effort is really to recast these actors as responsible, or at least more responsible agents of public power, to define clearer duties that they had both vis-a-vis -vis the state and vis-a-vis -vis citizens. Uh, there's an interesting, if you will, wave of legislative changes that takes place in many of these uh, East European countries in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And through that legislation, another thing happens, which is an internationalization of the field of security, because some of the key pieces of legislation essentially open up the field to global private security companies. And what you see is the influx in many of those countries of companies like G4S and Securitas that become both key participants in the provision of private security. And there's an interesting link once again between security and economics because G4S and Securitas are crucial to the process of integrating these uh, countries into the global market. They are the key security providers of, for instance, uh, key global banks. And at the same time, they become almost quasi-extensions of the state by becoming involved in, let's say, the protection of critical infrastructure, compensating for certain types of state weakness. For instance, they have access to the types of technology that states simply cannot afford to purchase in that part of the world. So you do see, again, I'm making a long story short, but you do see a shift away from the kind of jungle capitalism that prevailed in the early 1990s. But this is not in any way an unproblematic process. There are a number of key challenges and difficult normative dilemmas that arise. And to mention just a couple, first of all, uh, there's a reconstitution of the public, the demos, if you will, in a narrow sense. What's involved in these processes of trying to gain more control over the private actors, like private security companies, is essentially an effort to empower the executive at the expense of legislatures. If you look at those pieces of legislation, control over private security companies is left in the hands of the police and the ministries of interior. In other words, there's a replication of that problematic trend associated with neoliberalism, uh, which is a redistribution of power within the state. Second, uh, there's a partial commercialization of key state agencies. What happens in countries like Bosnia and Bulgaria, and some even countries like Latvia that would be considered unproblematic, if you will, um, much more advanced liberal democratic countries, is that certain police contingents, certain units or agents of the state are not just public security providers, but they start providing private commercial security services to private actors. What that means, of course, is that state agencies start to enact a hybrid logic. They are at once public security providers and participant, profit-seeking participants in market transactions. And of course, that complicates the relationship between citizen and paying customer. And it also raises new, new and difficult challenges and dilemmas about political representation and about the ability of the state to provide that key public good security. So I'll end here because my time is up, but thank you so much. Thank you. Is it going? Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm loud. <laughs> thank you everyone for coming and, and, and particularly thank you to Jackie and Alexandra and everyone who contributed to this project for asking myself and Rita Abrahamson who unfortunately can't be here today to be part of this. Um, we ended up writing the conclusions, 
conclusion to this book. I almost said the confusion to this book. And in fact, the slip is actually not a slip of the tongue. It's one of the more confusing things that I've ever done in my life. And the conclusion is, I hope, not totally confused as much as it is an attempt to try to sort out some of the reasons that we, in particular, at least speaking for myself, I found this process so incredibly confusing. And I think it's confusing because in some ways it challenges some of the most central ways that we think about modern politics. To question the question, to question the problem of where is the public in global governance. It seems to me there are two ways that we can approach this. The first is a sort of sociological analysis and the second is a philosophical analysis. The sociological, I think it's possible to understand quite well. I think many of the chapters, indeed all the chapters in this really quite wonderful book, deal with the kinds of structural social transformations that we're seeing at a global level that involve not simply the marginalization of the state, not simply the retreat of the state, but in fact what Sasky Assassin calls the rearticulation of the state. That is a process in which the state has become partially disassembled into its component bits, but has not therefore been marginalized or does not disappear, but in fact gets reassembled at a global level in new kinds of global assemblages where different bits of the state now interact with their co-partners in various kinds of transnational structures. In other words, the public is totally part of globalization. One sees this most clearly in global finance, but I think one sees this in pretty much every element of globalization, and those are all covered up very, very well in this book. So, so far so good. I think I understand, probably wrongly, but I do think I understand the sociology of the public in the global, in this sense of what's happening to the state. My problem emerges when I think about a second meaning of the public, not simply public institutions, but the much more conventional meaning of the public, i.e. the people. Jackie asked at the beginning, what is the public and where is it? And to be perfectly honest with you, I run aground on this very difficult question. For me, when I get confused, I do the thing that I always do, which is retreat to Thomas Hobbes. It helps me to think. And Thomas Hobbes, I think, is perhaps most useful in terms of the legacy here for how hard it is for us to think about what the public might mean at a global level. And his argument runs something like this. The people is not a description of those existing individuals with their own interests and dynamics and desires out there in the world. The people only comes into being, into being as a political category via a process of representation. Before that process of representation, the people are what Hobbes calls the multitude. They are the unrepresented mass. Our conception of the people then is intrinsically tied to our understanding of them as represented by the public. That is what the people do. I'm gonna read you, if I may bear upon you for one moment. I hope you find this as fun as I do. One of the most mind-boggling paragraphs that I think Hobbes has ever written, but which exemplifies the problem we're trying to think about here 300 years ago, better than 300 years ago. He writes, the people is somewhat that is one, having one will and to whom one action may be attributed. None of these can properly be said of a multitude. The people rules in all governments, for even in monarchies the people commands. For the people will by the will of one man, but the multitude are citizens, that is to say subjects. In a democracy and aristocracy, the citizens are the multitude, but the court is the people. And in a monarchy, the subjects are the multitude, and however much it seems a paradox, the king is the people. This is the way that we think about publics and their relations to peoples. We only have a conception of a people 
as a public through institutions of representation. The problem for me becomes when those institutions of representation, i.e. the institutions of the state, become globalized into transnational forms and transnational structures with other elements of other disaggregated states. They certainly represent the public, but do they any longer represent the people? There is a gap between the people and the public. And it seems to me that that gap goes beyond questions of representation in any narrow institutional sense. The problem goes right to the heart of how we think about global publics. I would argue, in fact, that within the dominant categories through which we think about modern politics, it is impossible to think about a global public. There is no return of a public in global governance in this second sense because there quite literally cannot be. As such, there is a fundamental contradiction between the second sense of public and the first sense of public. And that contradiction itself is the constitutive political problematic of contemporary global governance. And until we can wrap our heads around that, it seems to me that the political challenges that we confront will continually be played out within its various logics. And for me, the source of my confusion is that although I think I can understand, perhaps, the rough contours of the problem, I, and I'm not sure anyone else, has at this point any sense of what the solution might look like. Thus, confusion. <laughs> That's it. Great. Uh, under time, thank you very much. Let's open it up for Q&A. We have ample time. We have 30 minutes, possibly more. Uh, who would like to start? Uh, how did you decide to go with practice theory as opposed to some other theoretical framework? I, I wonder. I looked at the, the definition of practices on uh, pages 26, 27 of the book, and you say in the footnote that uh, it's very similar to the one advanced by Adler and Pliot in their volume also that same time, 2008. Uh, there are some key differences, however, and, and I'd like to... Uh, I'd like you to talk about you know, the decision-making process and judgment that went into uh, uh, outcome of picking practice defined as the way you define it as opposed to some other form of theorization, you know, performances, Foucault, uh, any number of theoretical perspectives that you could have used to make both arguments that you're making in, in, in the book. So in other words, what's the value added of practice theory? Uh, yeah. I'll start. I'll let you finish. I just actually, I want to say for those who, I would encourage people to get up and grab a some food if you haven't done so already. And book flyers are also. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that too, of course. Um, I mean, the short answer is simply that we it was an inductive process that we were trying to figure out what was going on, and and finding that traditional frameworks weren't making sense. That it wasn't simply private, you know, the continuation of private authority, even though clearly there was a lot of. Private, private actors, private processes, and so on in play. It wasn't a logic of, of just simply a return of public goods. Um, it wasn't a kind of a liberal notion of a, a global public sphere. We were struggling with what, what was happening. Um, and again, this was partly us just having informal conversations often and re recognizing that even though I worked on finance and development and she worked on security, there, was, there were interesting parallels going mm -hmm. on. Um, and so that combined with the fact that as one does, you know, we were reading around um, theoretically in sort of similar areas and found the notion of practice to be a very useful resource, I think, for thinking, trying to think more broadly but precisely at the same time, trying to actually give some shape to what we were seeing. It's, instead of just saying it's a hybrid or it's both or it's instead thinking, okay, what is it that, you know, sort of thinking of public not as a thing but as a, an adjective. What is it, that, what, or what is the publicness? Where is the public, but, but it's also not where is the public physically, but what is it that is public? What, what about it makes it public? Um, and thinking that actually um, understanding it in terms of sort of practices um, really 
uh, it's not about where you are, but what you're doing, mm -hmm. made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, and we define it very broadly in the introduction because we do have people, you know, practice turn is very broad. You know, my, I tend to draw more on actor network theory. Um, you know, Alexander draws more on um, Bourdieu. Um, we have other people who are, who are using it in a much more kind of general, less theoretically, you know, explicit form and so on. So we, we, we did try to define it broadly, I think, for that reason. Can I just add, I mean, in, in part, I think it also had to do with our sense of perhaps frustration of the existing literature, because mm -hmm. we were looking at the privatization literature. We were looking at the literature on um, the public sphere, uh, on public goods. And of course, you learn a lot from all of these different bodies of literature, but I think even as they were talking about the changing relationship between public and private and more power going to private and so on and so forth, there was still a sense that you still had these clear, neat, distinct domains of activity. There was something that was institutionally bound, that was in, found in a particular place, if you, want, if you want, and that was called the public. And there's something else that was called the private. And you had revolving doors between them, mm. uh, more transition, blurring of the boundaries, but still you had those distinct domains. And we wanted to think differently. We wanted to say, no, as long as we hold on to that conception, that mental image of distinct, uh, neat, neatly defined, defined uh, domains of activity, we can't understand what's going on. That's why I know that whole question of what and where the public is. And I, we thought that by looking at practices, we could start to make sense of that, start to make sense of ways in which you have historically specific sets of practices through which something, a type of actor, or a type of process comes to be defined as public or not. Mm -hmm. And you can also see in the contemporary uh, context, processes of contestation. You know, where do you draw the line? What is public and what is not? What is of common concern? And what is it that's really not of common concern? Um, in the case of my study, for instance, you look at this rearticulation of the field of security in different former communist countries, and you see that there's really a lot of contestation over what exactly counts as a matter of common concern. So in the early years, uh, there was, for instance, in Bulgaria, a lot of involvement of organized crime that was empowered by weak legislation because the prevailing view at that point in time was that what happens between, let's say, a private company and their private security providers is a private matter. Right? The state should not become involved in that. We are all good liberals now, we are privatizing, it's the logic of the market. That's all a private concern. The state is not going to legislate that. And you know, a few years after that, they start realizing, oh gosh, we have you know, uh, fights in the streets of some of the smaller towns in Bulgaria where clearly these private security actors are imposing their own vision of justice. Right. They are the only type of enforcement mechanism in town. They're quite effective. But they are effective in a very pathological, you know, criminal way. And they are allowed to be effective in that pathological way because their acti activities have been defined as private, therefore not of common concern. So we wanted to capture some of those complexities and practices of contestation and change. And we thought that the practice turn would enable us to do so. Okay. Thank you. So we've got two questions over there. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Paul. I work in the field of governance. I was just trying to track the whole uh, uh, s sort of logic of the book, and I, I guess I got some understanding that it started with some sort of information liberation that, that's going on, and it, it, it maneuvered its way into, into complexity. Uh, complexity is being a space that, that, say, acts without intention and without uh, being able to, to control it, so to speak. So the question was with regards to the public, uh, uh, certainly uh, the question that you asked is do you need to understand the effects of, of, uh, of, of what you're doing in the, in the complex space? In other words, the complex space is going to, is going to do its thing. Uh, or will just complexity accommodate what you are going to do by virtue of definition? As you're going to do something, you are going to be now part of complexity and it's going to have to do something. So the, the notion of, of the public entering 
bring complexity in a sense, does that have a certain sufficiency for it? So I would say if you're going to liberating information, to liberating complexity, what is the role of the public now in entering that, that kind of space in some sense of being the complexity as opposed to trying to, to control it? That didn't make any sense. I'll have a go because I think it's my chapter really that deals with the, the complexities of frame. Um, I, and in a way, I, I was thinking a lot while Mike was talking, it connects to, to the, the, my confusions. Um, and I, so I use complexities of frame specifically to deal with the way that climate change as a, as a and people say an issue, but that's a sort of fairly but now not, 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 not remotely adequate term as a, as, a, as a condition of our contemporary existence, shall we say, um, as, a, as a problem of complexity in the senses that I tried to articulate. So it is simply, if, at one level, it's the case. It's, how, it, it's an ontology of understanding how, how the various processes that both generate climate change and generate our responses to it, et cetera, et cetera, are ontologically organized, connected to each other. And therefore, for me, the question was, well, what does the word public mean in that, in that context, where at least I would say for most traditional accounts of the public, it implies a singularity. It implies a place, you know, your, your invocation of Hobbes, it implies a single place where these things come together and are represented. And, that, and so the, uh, the logic of complexity, and maybe there are other context of global politics, you could articulate that, but it's certainly, to my knowledge, it's in relation to something like climate change that it's been most extensively done, um, I think probably for quite good reasons, that um, it is simply no longer possible to make the statement that there is a single place where the public, whether it's a, whether we, whether we, we, even without dealing with the question of the global public, where the public as a singular thing can be said to exist. It, it, it cannot be represented in a national parliament, it cannot be represented in a United Nations as the single site where all public things go on. Uh, and so what I do in the chapter there is, to, is, which is a slightly different take, I think, than to what Mike's, where Mike was coming from earlier on, is to try and think about the public as a quality of interaction. And the way that, that is, so that at every single, every site where, the question then becomes that all of these myriad sites where decisions are being made that are relevant in relation to climate change, what might it mean to say, both empirically and normatively, that these either are or might become public in some sense of the term. Um, so it's not a question of, so I think it's a slightly different way of thinking about it than, than, than I suspect where you're coming from. But that's, science. sorry? As in com complexity science. As in, yeah, the theories of complex, uh, complex adaptive synthesis, which were developed first and foremost in cybernetics and, 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 and ecology uh, in the 40s and the 50s, and then have become a theory of... Uh, but, uh, and so in the climate change context, it's usually talked about in two contexts. One is you've got socio-ecological systems interacting in a complex manner, but you've also got social systems and the policy systems and the, uh, as themselves... Uh, ha exhibiting all the features of complexity like emergence and tipping points and path dependence and blah, 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 that associated with that theory. I'm not taking that question goes to Professor Thank you. Uh, I wanted to have uh, more explanation about if practiceness, if publicness is a field of practice, what is the the relation between publicness and stateness. Because I, I'm not sure I really understood uh, if we consider sociology of the state and the creation of a symbolic capital, which is specific to the state, it's to say that we have a monopoly on something called public. So what is the relation you are doing? Because now we have a... Is publicness the destruction of stateness? <laughs> Is it a rearticulation? How how it works? And uh, and may I a very quick question to 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 Mike? Uh, you you define through Hobbes, okay? <laughs> but at the same moment, of course, it, Hobbes defined 
through the idea of the unicity. And don't we have the possibility to define differently, like Rancière, that what is at stake is not the unique of the people, but what are all the categories which were not the people and can become the people? I mean, one overly simplistic answer is to say that perhaps one could say that s stateness is a subcategory of publicness, but I think at the same time we're disaggregating, just as Mike was talking about, the disaggregation and transnationalization of the state. So th that com complicates publicness, but at the same time, um, I think quite a few of the chapters are, are defining pu the public in a way that includes civil society, um, or what, again, is more than, it's not though just civil society, but it's looking beyond the state and even in some ways beyond civil society so that we can in fact have market actors um, who in a particular moment because of how they are framed, engaged, what they are doing, the kinds of claims they're making about what they're doing can be understood as public actors engaged in a set of public processes. Um, even though in most other kind of straightforward ways we would not define them as such. So it is I mean, some would argue it's that classic case of a concept that gets so big that is it too big in a sense? But it's certainly, I think, we're trying to broad, broad, broaden it well beyond um, association with the state while at the same time recognizing that the state is very often linked to these public practices in one way or another, but not always. Yeah, and I think to pick up on this, I mean, I think in our view, the rearticulation of the public, the inclusion of public conventionally seen as private actors in the performance of certain public functions complicates the relationship with the state and there is no one answer, there is no one relationship between the public and the state. In some cases, mm -hmm. through the involvement of these conventionally seen as private actors in the performance of public functions like security, the state is actually empowered. It can exercise powers, it can control areas of life uh, that it wouldn't be able to control without the help new technologies, and new skills provided by these uh, private actors that perform public functions. And at the same time, this of course can weaken the state because it can raise questions about the credibility of the state. In my case, once again, once you see private actors, private companies performing this fundamental good for ensuring public security, and you see that the state in some regions, in some areas, in some instances, <coughs> is simply not able alone to perform those functions. There's a credibility gap. Uh, it's simply in, in some areas, as I was, I was looking, in some cities, some towns, in some instances, the state alone, without the help of provided by both human resources and technological support coming from private security companies, it would simply not be able to ensure domestic work. It would not be able to protect critical infrastructure. So in a way, through the involvement of these private actors in the performance of a public function, the state is empowered. But at the same time, this raises questions about you know, who controls who in that context. And to what extent we still have a legitimate state, the image of the state as the provider of public security to all. I mean, that becomes you know, uh, hugely complicated. And you also see, as I said, you know, the gap between uh, public, sorry, citizens, and citizens defined, defined as uh, consumers. Right, paying consumers. So there is a gap. Those paying consumers are more valuable and more valued citizens than those citizens who cannot afford to pay. Which of course dismantles our whole conception of what the state should look like um, in a modern liberal democracy. I, I, I understand very well uh, the answer and the dynamics. But in some way, if you use publicness, mm -hmm. why do you use state and not stateness? Mm -hmm. Because there you jump from mm -hmm. a sociology of practice mm -hmm. and you use publicness, and then instead of using the same logic of practice for the state, mm -hmm. you use state as an institution. <coughs> so of course, publicness is bigger mm -hmm. than state institution, but. So my question was publicness and stateness, the two logic of practice. 
but, but uh, yeah. I, I don't know. No, I think that's a very good point. It's it's a, was, uh, yeah. Maybe uh, uh, I misplaced I just, my. Uh, no, 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 it's, it's an excellent question. point. Just one quick, and it doesn't, you know, it's a huge question. We can't answer it fully, but one quick point. For instance, when you think about, you know, Charles Tilly and Max Weber on what statements means, you know, the creation of these in institutional structures of the modern state. Uh, in, at least in my case studies, what happens is that this monthly of those. It's almost like a personalization of power through the creation of these networks of actors that perform public function. So stateless, I think, comes to mean something different from what we had expected. Yeah. Yes. Um, Merci, uh, Marie Jose, School of Political Studies. The first thing I want to say, it's mostly a comment, not a question, but if you have reaction, of course. Um, I think this is a very timely book, and I'm really happy to hear more about it today and looking forward to see the paperback copy so I can buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first thing. I think it's really, really interesting, even the the terms in which you are bringing that that key discussion of governance back to thinking the public and thinking the relationship between public and private. And thinking of my own background and research, I was really happy to see that you are focusing on practices to begin to question, you know, more conventional theoretical framework. My uh, comment was that when I wrote my PhD, which seems quite many years ago now, I was both um, intrigued on how to make sense of practices and which kind of theoretical framework I could use. And some of you will remember that I use a Gramscian framework of analysis. And one of the reasons I did so is that because I was very much looking at civil society actors, social movement resistance, and at least the Gramscian analysis was allowing this linkages between public and private, state, on a much broader frame. And so potentially a comment from you guys or a question could be, how do you see that literature uh, in relationship to what you've been uh, making as decision in the theoretical framework you're counting on to do that? But I'm looking forward to read the chapters. Merci. Yeah, but take this one first and we'll come, come at the end. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure where to start on that. I think that there are points of contact, and but I think in some ways that the practice, I guess, the practice turn has, I think, gone, has moved quite a ways in the intervening time. And so there are more resources. I don't know if anyone in our book actually mixes Gramsci and some of these other approaches, but I certainly have students who are trying to do that. And so I think that there's, in that sense, it's, um, I would see it as potentially complementary, although, again, the initial framing, I think, is less class-based or less, you know, it's, 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 it's ontological starting points are, tend to be somewhat different, but at the same time, my, my approach to a lot of theoretical approaches is more the toolbox rather than the, the orthodoxy. And so in that sense, I think um, there's some really useful conversations that could happen. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm helping some students try to think those through. Not always easily, as you know, we know that it can be hard. And you yourself was doing, were doing some of that. You, do, you weren't exclusively using Gramsci. You were also doing some no, cultural yeah. theory. And so, yeah, again, yeah, really, yeah, you know, yeah trying to figure it out. Yeah, theory, yeah, know, yeah, 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 exactly. So I would say, in some ways, this is perhaps continuing that, that conversation and that negotiation mm -hmm. struggle. I, I just come in on that partly because my the first of the two sort of cases that I talk about is precisely arising out of the problematic which mostly comes from Gramscian or some version of neo-Marxist literature on the privatization of governance, especially of environmental governance. And so, it, and there is a certain legacy of thinking about it in terms of hegemony and counter-hegemony there and co-optation and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think the interesting thing then, then comes is because, again, that literature, like lots of other literatures, is, is, is often, not always, but often couched in terms of a single site of struggle. Maybe there's multiple sites, like there is, there is there's, you know, when you're in the war of position, war of movement, all that type of stuff, you'll be articulating struggles in different places, but there's nevertheless a single struggle. <laughs> 
Um, and so again, for me, I mean, one of the things about the two things about that one is the multiple sites. Then, then really intervenes about what are the conditions of thinking of it in terms of hegemony and counter hegemony and these blocks, two blocks confronting each other, um, and the process of cooptation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The other is that the, one of the conditions of coming back to the complexity theory stuff is that um, sometimes within that frame, people frame climate change as what's known as a super wicked problem, and one of the features of calling something super wicked uh, rather than merely just average wicked uh, is that those who are seek those who are seeking to resolve the problem are those who have caused it um, and so you've got a different logic of opposition it's still a agonistic conflictual logic but it's also the uh, the, the, the the logic the 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 agonism is, is an internal one as well as a class one and so that's it's more of a logical it's maybe no I, I won't go in the back direction but so I think that those two things make simply applying Gramscian stuff quite difficult to do, not impossible, but why I wouldn't go purely down that route. Okay. Yeah, I'm just wondering uh, if you, any of you can answer this question. Was it, was, it really, uh, dereg was it really deregulation the primal cause of the financial crisis, or is the term deregulation a smokescreen? Is it really delegislation? Because one can allude to uh, how uh, Glass-Steagall was repealed, and then essentially it's essentially that when, a, say, a neoliberal spokesperson would say we need more regulation, that usually entails we need more useless government bureaucracy rather that we need to reinstate actual laws that prevent you know, the financial sector being intertwined with the commercial banking sector and causing all these uh, shadow banking securities options of fraud that's going on behind the scenes and all this accounting fraud behind uh, how many of these financial institutions operate on, the, on Wall Street. So, and a second question would be, yeah, I, I usually run out of breath quite easily. Um, my second question would be: uh, Do you uh, do any of you see uh, the role of BRICS? Uh, do you see uh, role? Uh, do you see BRICS? Uh, sorry. Do you see uh, the role of BRICS playing on the international field as far as countering uh, the hegemony of the IMF and World Bank? Does BRICS really have a uh, integral role to play as far as international development is concerned as well? So, if you want to answer either one of those two questions. <laughs> I mean, I, I think we could spend forever talking about the causes of the recent financial crisis. Um, I mean, yes, absolutely, a culture of deregulation and the repealing of, of, of legislation. Also, uh, very conscious decisions not to regulate. And so around derivatives specifically, that you know, there were efforts by um, certain agencies to, to try, regulators to try to get some regulation, and there were conscious efforts um, by Greenspan, by um, you know some of Clinton's main um, uh, advisors, and so on, to and very successful efforts to prevent the regulation of those uh, types of securities, and all of this clearly played an important role, enabling conditions for the, ultimately for the financial crisis. And we could spend a lot of time talking about the com complexities of those dynamics, which go from the extremely abstract, um, the mathematical, to simply you know the production of a of a a global and certainly national cultures of, of house buying and so on. Like the, everyone used to say, real estate is always local, which is true to a certain extent. Which is why they always said, you know, a downturn in one market won't affect any big, you know, wider than that. And of course, partly it's these instruments that linked allowed people to to essentially invest in someone's mortgage in Wisconsin or whatever, even if they were living in Sweden. Um, but it was also the fact that we're all watching the same television shows, you know, about flipping your house, which meant we also all bought into a culture of commodification and, and this belief in the endless increase in pr housing prices, which meant that we were all investing and then disinvesting, actually, except us Canadians. We just continued investing. And the rest of the world, we're waiting for our bubble to pop. Mm. And the BRICS, I'm not an expert on that. This is Brazil, China, India, et cetera. Um, but absolutely, I think they're, they're posing a really interesting challenge to the IMF, the World Bank, especially the OECD, which explicitly is not about them. Um, but um, it's going to be very interesting to see where that goes, because these institutions have largely been very heavily dominated by, West, by the West. And actually, the IMF and the World Bank heavily dominated by the US on the one hand, and Western Europe on the other have an unusual, lovely large number of seats. So, We'll see where, where that goes.
Je pense que cette séance était assez extraordinaire. And please join me in thanking our panelists, uh, book authors and, and contributors for, for, for their time and wonderful presentations. Thank you.